Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending July 28th, 2018. This is the second TDD Report for July. Next one will be second week in August. Why am I wearing a hat, you may ask. Very important reason. I came inside from outside and I didn't take it off. So first story is from... Oh my gosh, stupid pop-up went in the way. Let me see if I can get rid of it. And... Ah, I hate these stupid things. Okay, there it goes. Got the little X. Takes forever for the little X to come up. Okay, from Variety. Cord cutting it keeps churning. U.S. pay TV cancelers to hit 33 million in 2018. So that's even an increase from last year. I guess last year it was 24.9 million cord cutters. Now it's 33 million. Um, a climb of 32.8 percent. So uh, I was just curious too. Uh, I asked my grandkids that live close by about TV and I guess for them they just don't watch TV as a regular thing. They do stuff on their iPhones or uh, Androids or stuff like that. So it's not really important. As a matter of fact, seven years ago I cut the cord too. I just realized I wasn't watching the TV. My wife wasn't watching the TV. Nobody in the household was watching the TV and I was paying monthly for it. So I got rid of it. So I would like to ask you guys out of curiosity if you get a chance uh, check out this article too because it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. Now there are more people signing up for streaming services so that is at its increase too. In fact I think Netflix is going like gangbusters. Uh, Amazon Prime that's pretty useful too and plus the fact you're paying for the Amazon Prime and they throw in the the videos and the movies for free so that's kinda helpful too. Um, I think they raised the price it was ninety nine dollars a year now it's hundred and ten something like that but I'm an Amazon Prime member so in the comments below, let me know if you guys have been a cord cutter, if you decided to finally get rid of uh, cable and go to uh, over-the-air free TV, or if you've just gotten rid of TV altogether. I don't even own a TV set myself. My TV set's gone. Gave that away because uh, I just, like I said, I, I'm not going to keep something that I don't really have a reason to use. So next, from Popular Science, a car-sized spacecraft will blast off towards the sun in August. Just like beachgoers looking to get a tan, NASA has its own date with the sun this summer. This August, the agency will launch the Parker Solar Probe on a seven-year journey to get closer to the sun than any other man-made object. This is actually, eventually, after a number of orbits and a number of years, going to actually enter the sun's corona. Now, they've developed, using technology, they've developed a really nice heat shield for it. Uh, but as close as it is to the sun, a lot of people would think, well, still, wouldn't it burn up? Well, there's another article, and I'll give the link below, too, besides this article from Popular Science. There's another article that talks about the fact, the difference between heat and temperature. And so um, it's called Why the Sun Studying Parker Space Probe Won't Melt. That's a popular mechanics article. The best way I can explain it is the particle density, even when you go through the corona, there are charged particles and very high energetic particles of very high temperature, but they're so small and there's so few of them. It would be like if you went into a room and I put 10 BBs in that room at 1,000 degrees, they might raise the temperature in the room a little bit, but you're not going to be in any kind of danger. But if I put 100,000 BBs heated to 1,000 degrees in that room, that's a lot more mass and a lot more heat energy. So you're going to have a, a bad time with that. So, yeah, it's just a matter of the mass and the number of energetic particles. So by having a specialized heat shield, and it's a liquid-cooled heat shield, uh, they will be able to shield it from the face of the sun itself and the rest of the craft, even though it will be around very high-energy particles, it still will, if they if they designed it right, it still will survive. And uh, by the year 2024, I guess it is, that it will actually get close enough. And the reason they're doing this is especially since we're talking about going to Mars, uh, coronal mass ejections are going to be very dangerous for astronauts to have to face, and they want to use this probe to learn more about the sun so they can study and maybe be able to predict farther ahead of time these coronal mass ejections so that people on Mars or if there's uh, astronauts on the moon or something like that will get enough warning before these things hit so they can take cover. So if you get a chance to check that out, links to all the articles will be in the description below. And then uh, a few last articles here, just uh, kind of interesting here. The uh, um, well, first let me talk about this, the underground lake. I'm going to talk about the underground lake in, on Mars. Uh, Water is buried beneath Martian landscape study, says so this is from ABC News. This is up near the poles, and it's about a mile and a half underneath the ice. And it's something like, they said, maybe possibly an aquifer, although they don't know it's it's liquid, mar, uh, liquid uh, water within the soil itself. 
Uh, could be one scientist said maybe it's only about two inches deep, but the reason why it doesn't freeze, even though this water exists at about maybe 20 to 40 below zero Fahrenheit, the reason why this water doesn't exist is it's really, really salty. It's full of uh, these kind of salts that Mars has on it that uh, uh, are just, you know, able to take the water and make it so that it won't freeze, just like extremely salty ocean water can survive, you know, below freezing temperature because of the amount of salt on it. So um, this water being that it could be, you know, uh, well, that it is one and a half miles below uh, ground, astronauts themselves, when they get to Mars, it's not very likely they're going to use that for a water source. What they're talking more about here is the fact that uh, on Earth we have extremophiles that can live at very low temperatures. I mean, they're very tiny creatures and uh, something like bacteria and stuff like that, but some of these can actually survive these extreme low temperatures. So they expect that even if this water is like minus 20, minus 40 degrees, they may be able to actually find some life. Now, what are the chances they will actually be able to, to do anything with this, like be able to drill down and use any kind of probes or anything like that? I don't think even when we get to the point on Mars to where we have a semi-permanent colony or even a permanent colony on Mars, uh, when are we going to actually take the time to set up some kind of drilling equipment to be able to drill more than a mile down? I don't think that's going to come in anytime soon. So right now, this stuff is just kind of conjecture as to whether this would be a place that life could possibly exist, but it is, it's a, you know, just to find a place that we know fairly sure, we're fairly sure has liquid water in it, even though it's very salty liquid water. It's about 12 miles wide too, by the way, so it's not really huge, but they think because this, they've discovered this place that um, it's probably going to end up being at other places too, they're going to have liquid water underground. Maybe some of it will be closer to the surface, I am not really sure, but the other thing is because the whole Mars environment too, if you've uh, seen that movie, uh, Mars, where the guy grows the potatoes and stuff like that, too. We're going to have to do something about the soil in Mars, too, because it's so full of these kind of salts, too, these um, things that are deadly, all these uh, chemical ingredients that are deadly to plants and stuff like that. Trying to grow a garden on Mars with the soil just the way it is is not going to be very doable. So we're going to have to start out maybe with some soil from Earth or find some way to get this uh, amount of salt out of it. And last up, the uh, Chinese space probe last Sunday now, they said it did come down, the, the space uh, Chinese uh, uh, space station, that they, some people said it was out of control. China claimed that it, they were going to do a controlled entry. Who knows who was correct, but it seems like it's very possible that China could be correct and they did a controlled entry because last Sunday at a little bit after 8 p.m., it splashed down in the South Pacific Ocean and they called it the spacecraft graveyard because that's where you want your spacecraft to splash down, or at least what's left of it after it burns up in the atmosphere. So it looks like in this case, if any of it was left to splash down, probably only fishes were the only ones that were aware that this thing of the exact place and time that this thing finally splashed down. But I've got to, um, I've got to think that this was uh, more likely to be a controlled reentry because they put it right in the place that you want to put it. If any of the pieces did actually make it, so good, for, good thing for that. But even 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 as they say, no matter where it would have come down, the likelihood of it ever striking a human being, I think there's only one or two cases even recorded of a human being being uh, hit by uh, pieces of uh, spacecraft or anything like that. Might have might only have been, been one. I'm not sure if it's one or two. I think one might have been an asteroid, a lady that was hit in her living room with an asteroid. Uh, but, yeah, it's just uh, pretty, pretty close to impossible and even less likely than getting struck by lightning. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody, and I will catch you on the second weekend of August.